Hello, and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, and consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and profits. Now, I have a special guest today that's a non-surgeon, and I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Marie Work. Now, she's a practice management consultant, just like myself, and she's focused on business development, best practices, as well as marketing, and she's even created and formulated beauty and wellness products products for our industry. Now, Lisa Marie founded and operated the very first luxury medical spa in Vegas, and we'll ask her more about that. And then she's also a very sought after speaker at the medical conferences. She and I have been sharing the podium for years, like all over the US, and now we're going international. So Lisa Marie also supports many nonprofit organizations within her community. And she's interested, now this is really interesting. I don't know, this was so random. She reads and speaks Japanese fluently. So we'll ask her about that too. So Lisa Marie, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. Oh, Catherine, thank you so much for having me on Beauty in the Biz. I'm an avid follower and I listen to your podcast religiously. So big fan. And also I'm a big fan um, of you as a consultant in the plastic surgery space. You've been around for a while and I've learned a lot from you. And that's the pleasure of this. Like, I love hanging around with um, the competitors and some of them don't like it. And then you and I just get along very, very well. And I love sharing ideas and nobody has the market on all the ideas, you know, and frankly, at this point, there are probably not many new ideas. It's who can put them out there creatively and, um, um, and get people's attention and get people fired up you know, for this yeah. industry. So there, I don't, there's plenty for everybody, quite frankly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of times too, when we get clients, it's the clients that resonate with us. Um, and that's why they choose us because we have different styles and, you know, that's what makes us, you know, unique and, um, and also be able to work together and to lean on each other. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's wonderful to be a peer of yours. Uh, um, and that was a really good point. Not everybody jives with each other. So, yeah. um, so you, would, we definitely have different personalities. And so that's a really good point. So before I get off course, how in the world did you learn Japanese? The rest of us, usually we learn Spanish or I learned <laughs> a little French. How did you go to Japanese? You know, in college, in undergrad, I went to Willamette University in Oregon and I was in the Japanese dorm and I had a Japanese roommate. And so every day she would come in and she would actually knock on the door before she'd come into our room. And her name was Komiko. And I said, Komiko, you don't have to knock on the door. This is your room too. And she would say, oh, okay, thank you so much. And then she'd turn around, come back and knock on the door. And I thought, okay, I need to learn Japanese. So I studied Japanese for seven years, lived there for three years. And then I got my MBA in international management emphasis to East Asian Japanese techniques. Nice. And you were also a news reporter, right? I was, I was. I've had nine lives. Who's counting? Yeah, I was a financial news anchor in San Francisco up the street from you. Yeah, yeah. All right. I do. That is on my bucket list. I've never been, I want to go to Tokyo and I would, I'm assuming I'm like going to be the tallest person ever. Oh and my gosh. You would be, you would be, you would be. I love, I, I love the culture. I love how graceful they are. I love the food. Like if I could eat sushi every day, I would, that is clean eating. So it was it, did you love the food while you were there? You know, I did. I got tired of fish. You know, yeah. <laughs> if you went to, a, if you went to, you know, McDonald's, I mean, they have McDonald's there and you were to order like, you know, you're American. And sometimes you're like, yeah. you know, I could just use a Big Mac, but unfortunately the Big Mac would taste like fish. So you'd be like, ah, oh, just doesn't, it's not like America, but I love Japan. And I um, obviously was treated uh, very differently because of what I look like. You know, there's not a lot of well, I had red hair, if you can believe that back in the day, and people would come, I'd be sitting on the train station and I would feel people touch my hair that I didn't know. And I just, you know, it, it was very um, awkward for me to have that happen. And then people would come up and ask me if they could take my picture. Oh, wow. say, well, I don't know you, you know, what are you using this for? And they said, ah, you know, you're, you're an American, you're a foreigner. We want to take pictures of you. So 
It was a very different experience. I loved every second of it. I climbed Mount Fuji, if you can believe that, and uh, taught English um, to homestay moms and to executives at NEC and Panasonic and the different Japanese companies. And, um, you know, I also went to Tokyo International University there. I was going to get into their BECA program, which is a prerequisite for um, learning Japanese um, fluently enough to get your MBA over there. Wow. I know. <laughs> Somehow you went from that to our industry, and um, and we're glad you did. And that was like what fifteen years ago. And you opened, you founded, and opened your very first, the very first medical spa. I in- did, I did back in two thousand five. Um, you know, it was funny. I went to San Antonio to a medical, it was a medical spa. That's what the, I can't remember the name, but it was this wonderful conference, and I still know people from that conference today. And what I loved about the whole concept of medical spas was that it created that spa environment, that relaxation, that calming experience with medicine. And it reminded me of East uh, meets West, right? Where, you know, a lot of Eastern practices, medical practices um, are are very, um, they're just very calming and and everything is about, it's, it's not so sterile and cold. And so I thought if we could bring that together and marry that together, um, people would love to, you know, come in and they'd get their facials and then we did injectables and then we did um, hormone replacement therapies. So it was the first one in Las Vegas. Wow. And how long did you own it? We, uh, we were in business until 2011. And then I decided to, you know, start a family and, um, and, you know, move on to my next season of life. So that's, that's how that, that's how that ended. And I started consulting and loved consulting. I went around with a wonderful architect who worked, um, for the spa at, um, at Spanish Bay and at Pebble Beach Lodge and the Grand Wailea. And he actually got into um, creating more like villas and overnight, uh, you know, care facilities for plastic surgeons. Um, And so he was help building those out back then. And I was writing his feasibility studies and making sure we were within budget. Gotcha. So the reason I brought you on is because we want to talk about nurse injectors. Um, What is happening is, I'll tell you what what happened, why this all exploded was um, the surgeons always wanted to do surgery. And I've known the surgeons forever. And I thought your customer service is terrible. Like they wouldn't answer the phone. The staff wasn't friendly. The waiting was out of control. And it was just ripe for the taking because the patient with a credit card was not going to stand for that. They wanted service to go with these high prices. And the surgeons just, it's, they, it wasn't their focus. Like they didn't want to do injectables. They wanted to do surgery. So that was just um, such an opportunity for somebody to develop this medical spa concept. And now it's completely, you know, taken over. Um, so then the, the, now the surgeon has to say, okay, some surgeons have embraced injectables and they love doing them. They like doing them themselves. They love building that relationship. Some surgeons say, I still don't want to do injectables, but I don't want to lose the patient either. Right. Because this one and done, if you're around for a while, you realize, wait a second, this one and done can't be a good business model either. So right. that was creating this, um, this, um, vacillating. Should I get a nurse injector? Should I not get one? And in some practices, they've done such a great job that nurse injectors bringing in a million or two, and she's well worth the money. In other practices, they're just complaining the whole time saying, oh my God, I'm giving her so much money for what? Um, so that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, and you know so much about it because not only you know do you consult on it, you actually experienced it. So in your own, what was your own experience when you opened up your medical spa, when you were going to bring a nurse injector on, what criteria did you use? Well, the criteria for me, because I'm not a doctor, um, we had a medical doctor at the time and a supervising physician. We also had a visiting plastic surgeon that would come in and do consults. So what I needed is someone that is a, either a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. I didn't feel comfortable with a registered nurse. 
Um, just because the Nevada laws uh, require you to have a doctor that should be on site if you're a registered nurse and you are doing um, any type of injectables. So my first um, experience with this was hiring a physician assistant and a nurse practitioner. One, the nurse practitioner was actually experienced while the physician assistant was a newbie and she was trying to uh, gain experience in injectables because she, and like a lot of these, um, you know, uh, healthcare providers, mid-level healthcare providers, they, they are looking to make money. They're looking to make money in injectables and create a following and then, um, you know, take that following from your practice. And so that was the first time that I, you know, really was around um, what the politics, right, of hiring someone, having them come in, interface with the patients, do the procedures, and then the question was, whose patients are they? Because a lot of times the you know PA or the nurse practitioner will say, well, really, that's my patient. I've been injecting that patient. Um, that patient comes to me. That patient's going to follow me if I leave this um, this medical spa or if, or practice. And so you really it was really a quandary at the time as to, gee, you know, how do I protect my business um, from losing patients um, when the, when the injector walks out the door? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the big question. When you bring somebody on board, are you trying to bring an experienced person that has a following? Because I love that idea. If you can make it work and get the right person. What a great team because she just brought an influx of patients to you. And so, so you haven't, oh, you know, there's your marketing for the year. You know, she's got, she's brought the whole group with, however, on the other hand, she's one of those people who knows everything and she, she thinks she's the boss and she doesn't do well, you know, you know, working under a doctor. So um, what, it, what do you think is better? Do you hire a, or do you hire a brand new one? And, and they're green and you hire and train them yourself and and then hope they catch on and hope they're a good ejector because they have no experience. Um, and you can't afford, in today's world too, you can't afford bad results. You don't need any guinea pigs. You know, your patients don't want to be guinea pigs, um, you know, training somebody else. So what, what's, what, what would you suggest? Bringing on a newbie or an experience? Well, it really depends on the type of practice, right? So we talked in the beginning, we talked about plastic surgeons, they start their practice and a lot of them aren't uh, as busy as they'd like to be in the OR doing surgeries. So to supplement that income, they start doing, you know, non-invasive procedures like injectables. And so when they first start out, the injectables are some money that's coming in um, because their OR is not at full capacity. So they bring in someone that, well, first they don't bring in anybody in, right? They, they're doing it all. Then they start to realize, listen, I need to bring someone in because I don't want to be doing injectables. I'm a surgeon. I belong in the OR. Um, so you can either have someone who comes in as a newbie, but when they come in as a newbie, you really need to protect the practice. And that means that they need to know that the patients that you're feeding them, meaning feeding the, the injector, that those are the practice's patients. And how is that? Like, how do you... Um, how do you explain that to the injector is you say, well, who, when you think of the patient, who is the patient paying? Is the patient paying that injector or is that patient paying the practice? And just that answer alone is going to tell you it's the patient, the patient belongs to the practice. Um, the second thing that, that when you bring in an injector, even if it's a newbie or an experienced, is, you know, what kind of social media policy are you going to implement at that time? Um, a lot of times you see plastic surgery, you see medical, any type of medical spas, they, they allow their injector to have their own um, Instagram account and uh, the Instagram followers. Well, that hurts your business because that should be under the umbrella of your practice. So whenever I would hire an injector, regardless if they had a following or not, um, 
I would make sure that the social media is under, let's say, for example, Smith Plastic Surgery, it'd be Smith Plastic Surgery Injectables. So um, there is no question as to who those patients belong to. Um, so going back to, is it, a, is it a newbie or is it someone who has a following? Well, that just depends on how much money are you willing to spend? A lot of practices when they first start out or when they're getting going, they can't afford to pay 400,000 a year to an experienced with a large following injector. Um, or, or starting at forty to sixty dollars an hour for a a registered nurse, um, that's a lot of money um, for for a for a practice for a for a medical spa. So you really need to look at well, am I going to pay that person on a base pay, and what does that mean? What are the job descriptions and the roles and responsibilities of that employee? Or are you going to have it as an independent contractor? Are they just coming in and you're doing a 1099 form and you, they log in the hours that they've spent with you? They send you, they give you an invoice and then you pay off that invoice. Um, so there's many different ways to set up um, an agreement with an injector, but always make sure that your practice is being protected. I highly recommend when you're bringing somebody on board, have them sign an NDA or a non-compete. And the first thing somebody says is, well, you can't hold those up in court. It's not, that's not the point. The point is, is if they're not going to sign it, they're telling you right now, they're t they're, it's a yellow flag, red flag, whatever color you want. Um, that's, that's a clue that they're not thinking the same way you are. And I would also have them sign the social media policy. And that means everybody, all photos are watermarked and all posts go to this practice. She can't have her own. She's not building her practice on your photos or, you know, on your name. So um, or it, it has to all stay together. And if she won't sign, he or she won't sign those two agreements, um, then I would say it's a no go because it'll be it'll if it goes sideways, that kind of stuff gets ugly. Exactly. Um, you know, and you don't need that negativity. Um, but, but you know, a lot of this, you do have some responsibility. If you hire the right person, you've got to take care of them and respect right. them and make them feel part of the team. I've, cause um, I've talked to plenty of nurse injectors and they feel used and abused and um, the, the ones that aren't happy, you know, so right. it, goes, it goes two ways. I would, I would hire slowly, I also, what do you think about um, hiring the competitors? Uh, like when the nurse comes to you and says, hey, I work for your competitor, but I, I'd love to come over to you. How, how would you handle that? You know what? I, um, it's always a red flag for me. And I'll tell you why, because obviously, or not obviously, but you really need to look and see if they've signed a non-compete clause with the other doctor. And if, if let's say if they have, and they haven't told you about it, you don't need that bad blood between another doctor or another practice. You, we all need to, you know, be amicable, work together, so to speak. Um, there's plenty of business out there for all of us. And so we want to, you know, we, we want to be on the up and up as opposed to, you know, doing something shady and taking on an injector that signed a non-compete clause and an NDA agreement um, with someone that, that you know, and is, is a neighboring plastic surgeon or medical spa. And a lot of times, if I were the surgeon, I would pick up the phone and call the other surgeon and oh, yeah. one on one and just say, you know what, I just want you to know, Susan was in here looking for a job. What's up? You know, yeah. um, and I, I would just, I, I would be that transparent in today's world because you can head off an awful lot of drama at the front end rather than at the back end when you have to deal with just a lot of bad blood. Which is That's true. That's true. And you also have to make sure they have active licenses. A lot of times they'll come in and they'll say, oh yeah, I've done this and this and this. Okay. Well, let me see your license. And it has to be in good standing just to protect yourself. There's a, I mean, sadly, there's a lot of people out there that will say anything, you know, really to get the job, but you really need to do your due diligence as an employer and really find out, okay, you know, did they sign in on compete with someone else? Do they have a good standing? Is their license active? Um, 
you know, it, you really need to make sure that those references have are clear. Sometimes you need to even to do a background check. In fact, I recommend background checks anytime I hire someone. Um, I'll tell you a story about that. I was consulting with a group in, I'll just say Texas, because it's big enough that nobody will know who I'm talking about. And uh, she was a nurse injector there for a couple of years, um, really resisted my consulting, very much resisted it because I was digging in and asking questions. And long story short, it turns out she had she had called Allergan a year ago and uh, changed the ca- accounts. So all of the money that Allergan gives back to the practices was going into her own account. Um, by the time they found out they were 200 grand out oh. and, and he, um, the surgeon actually pressed charges and somehow they're still, it was like pending forever. And she had the audacity to get a job with the competitor right there in the neighborhood. And I don't, and the competitor was also a little on the shady side, I guess. So, um, they were meant for each other, but, um, that surgeon lost so much sleep over that and so much negativity and what a shame, like, yeah, well, it's a shame because you start to invest in that, in that employee or that independent contractor, you start training them, you start, um, you know, uh, transferring institutional knowledge about your, your practice, about your medical spa, about your organization. And it becomes a waste. It all becomes, you know, uh, it, it just, you, you don't get that return on your investment. In fact, you lose money as the moment you find out something like that, because they're taking all of that out the door. Well, another tip would be everything should be set up as a profit center on, on its own because they were such a big practice. Nobody was noticing the money was missing because they had a lot of big numbers going, but if they had practice like a silo, like the injective yeah. was a silo, the skincare was a silo, the lasers were a silo, they would have caught that much faster. Oh, so yeah. I highly recommend that. Yeah, let's talk about pay because it is all over the board. It matters where you live. It matters what your overhead is. A, a nurse here in California is a joke. It's ridiculously expensive versus maybe, I don't know, somebody in, I don't know, Oklahoma. I'm sure it's very different. Correct. Yeah, no, it's all over the place when it comes to, you know, um, when it comes to, uh, you know, compensation. Absolutely. Well, there are so many different scenarios, but the major ones are usually number one, you either hire them as an employee and you just pay them an hourly period. And they get to some of them like the employee perks. Some of them actually are looking for stability um, because they they try to do this on their own. They've tried to be this the traveling injector and it does. It's not as sexy as it seems. So a lot of them are just ready to settle. They want to find a home. They want benefits. They want to just do their nine to five, but make them full time, that kind of thing. Okay. So they're right. right. Another way is to make them an employee, uh, but give them less of a base pay and then give them some incentive to go above and beyond that. Right, right. And so, so you can start, okay. So first of all, you can start with just a commission, right? And I recommend that a commission when you have a, an experienced injector who has a, a, a large following, right? Because you are only going to, you are only going, she's only going to get her commission based off of the money she brings in off of the revenue the injector uh, generates, right? So when let's say, let's say just for example, um, and this is a very low number, but let's just say she brings in, your injector brings in 10,000 a month, right? And let's say you, your, your base monthly commission based off of a hundred thousand is 18%. So right there, she's getting 1800 a month and this is 10,000. Listen, people can make that in a day, less than a day, $10,000 on injectables. So right there, right? She's, her annual commission would be, you know, uh, let's say $22,000, right? That's her annual commission. Now let's say you have an injector that does 30,000 a month. So you're looking at the annual revenue generated is 360,000 a year, 
right? So let's say you increase your, her, her monthly base commission to 22%. Now you're looking at, she's making 6,600 um, a month just based off of commission. And her annual commission is about 80,000 a month or 80,000 a year. So it, it all, I mean, you know, it, it's all negotiable is what I'm saying, but the, tr but what we really want to be careful is, is that we don't want to give 40, 50% commission um, off of generated revenue sales, right? So you don't want to say, I will give you 50% or 40% off your gross commission because someone has to buy the products, right? Somebody has to buy the office supplies. Somebody has to pay for the overhead. And usually that's the practice. You know what, um, when it comes to the money part, because sometimes the doctors get caught up on, I've heard this over and over, I'm going to pay her six figures? No way. Like all they see is that six figures. But if she was bringing in a million, it that it, that's 10%, that's fine. You know, like just mm -hmm. keep remembering there's a, a, a math problem there. There what? is enough problem. You want to stay between 18 to 23% on any type of gross commission generated from the revenue coming in that that, that, that injector generates. Uh, you don't want to go over 25%. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. The way I, you know, the way I look at it, just generally speaking, when it's all said and done, when you know your costs, you know, your fixed costs, your variable, your commissions, when it's all said and done, if you can keep 25% profit margin, you can't make 25% anymore, any, like in the stock market. So if you can make it there, because your business is still probably your best business investment you'll make, um, then I would say it, it's a go. If yeah. it's anything under that, I would say you don't need the hassle. No. And then, and then you got to think about it too. Let's say you do a base pay. So let's say you're going to give someone $50 for them coming in. I would, their commission, I would have between two to 4% commission based on the revenue that comes in. So here again, we're looking at numbers, right? But let's say you work 24 hours a week on $50 an hour your your monthly salary is going to be over 5000 a month and then if you let's say you generate $30,000 in revenue you're going to at 4% your base monthly commission is going to be $1200 so add that you're going to hit 14000 so your total total compensations is almost $80,000 for your base pay and your commission and was that part time that could be 24 hours a week. Yeah. So yeah, that's part-time. Because one of the issues I have with the part-time in today's world, you're just trying to get really good at this because um, it's so uber competitive now. You're going to win if you're more a smooth running operation than if you're not. A lot of money is lost in the processes or lack thereof. Right. It's so difficult to build a team and a smooth operation when people are coming and going, like when they're not, they're not there all the time. And um, team building is really tough when one person's the prima donna who comes in just twice a day, twice a week and injects and leaves. And, um, and then the, and they, they're not building a team um, effort. So, and I don't know what the answer is. I'm just trying to give the variables. What kind of practice are you trying to build? And can you do it with part-timers? And I will tell you, it's way more difficult to do it that way. It is. It is way more difficult. You can have someone that, let's say, is your sole injector and a client that I've had, um, had the, the injector had the LLC. The injector bought all of the products oh. and, then, and then gave that plastic surgeon a percentage, right, of what she brought in. Well, she obviously brought in a million and then she gave him 400,000 and she kept 600,000. Right. So, and he, and, and the whole thing is he's like, well, I want to build, you know, a bigger injector. Uh, you know, I want to scale my inject, you know, my injector business. And she was like, why, what's the point I'm making good enough money. I don't need to. So it, you, you kind of, there is that, 
you know, that mark there where they lose the incentive. There's no more incentive to build the business. So you're kind of stuck. How interesting though, that she, she paid for everything. She, yeah. She was a PA and she paid for the, she paid for it all. He didn't want to worry about it. And so uh, she, and he fed her all of her patients uh, and, and then she put it under her LLC. Okay. Very interesting. I would just say um, the, where a lot of it goes sideways is the doctor's not watching the money. Um, so oh, yeah. I just wouldn't take that carte blanche. Oh, okay. Thanks for the 400. Like, I, and, and he, it was almost like a gift, you know, I, yes. um, that I just would never abdicate the accounting, you know, just yeah, yeah, no, you have to count your pennies as a physician, even when you don't have time, you really have to, I mean, yeah, somebody has to, because you've got to know, is this a profitable system that we're running here? Yeah, your bookkeeping, your accounts receivables, your accounts payables. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way to do that. So that's really interesting. Um, what do you think about um, who's medical? If somebody comes in, like a nurse comes in, that who's liable? Like how liable is a practice for um, a contractor or like right. a... You know, like a contractor needs to, they need to carry their own medical malpractice, right? Because no matter whatever happens, um, that patient is going to go after the doctor for sure. They go after the deepest pockets and they will go after the, the injector. They go after both. But I recommend that the injector has also insurance to help, um, you know, protect the, protect the, the providers. Would you say most of them do? And should you be asking that during the hiring? Yes, process? yes, you should you should be asking for that, especially if they're an independent contractor. If they're an employee, it's under the preview or the purview of the of the physician. Do you think a lot of them are covered personally? I don't think that I don't think they are. I don't think they are. Do I've you, never heard you of it. it. I don't think they are. I ask for it. I ask. I said, well, what's your medical malpractice? Oh, well, I need to get that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the injector who's the traveling injector in the area? And she works for three different competitors. Oh, gosh. Um, it's it's it could be a big hornet, you know, nest if if something happens. You don't, you know, it, it might be a great thing at first. She's going to a salon, but, you know, she also needs to make sure that the medical director knows exactly what she's doing, where she's going. The medical director needs to sign off on her charts. It depends on, is it a nurse? Is it a PA? Is a nurse practitioner? Um, it can be messy in all these different places, just because, um, well, if they're using an EMR, it might be easier, but back in the day when they would have all these charts and then, you know, they'd have to leave the charts there because you really can't take the charts everywhere because you don't want anyone to get into, you know, for HIPAA violations or anything like that. But, um, I prefer you just stay in one location. And if you grow out of that location, then you can have a second location and, and hire someone else to, you know, help you with injecting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're probably being really negative, because, but we want the audience to know that um, you want to watch out for this because it can be the stickiest relationship you have. It, um, oh, well, next to bring in a partner on, you know, that's another. Yeah. yeah. But my tips would be hire slowly. Yes. Take time, really yeah. know who this person is mentally, psychologically, reputation, credentials. All, know them well. I definitely yeah. do back, background checks. I'm shocked at how many shady people there are out there. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. I mean, I've seen some people on mugshots.com for God's sakes. Um, you know, so I don't know. Yeah. What, I, don't know, yeah. I, know I shouldn't laugh. I, I mean, I, I believe you. It's we're, we're very naive and, you know, a lot of physicians and my father's a physician, uh, they don't learn business in medical right. school. So they're very trusting people. And, um, that's a good part about them. And then it's also can be very dangerous for them in business. Well, and, but they're also not at all interested in business typically. So they'd rather abdicate that whole thing and hope it all works out fine. And they just want to know the bottom line, you know, how much did she cost me? 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, but you know, so you have to take some responsibility for that. So I would say the ones that I have seen work the best, I would yeah. just, use, the ones that work the best, they're full time. They have very clear, uh, uh, tasks, very clear. It was all done in writing at the beginning. This is what I expect from you. They signed the non-compete, even if it weren't going to, they sign the non-compete, they sign the social media policy. Um, they were, um, they're told very specifically, all watermarks go on all our photos. Um, we own the patient, obviously that you can't hold everyone to it, but the more that's discussed up front, but then treat them like a team member. Don't that's treat them like don't treat them differently. Don't treat them like a prima donna either. You know, like when they start calling the doctor by his first name because they think they're, you know, one on one with the doctor. That I would say those are some of the signs. They won't sign anything. Um, they resist anything in the office, like team meetings. Um, they won't show up for team things. They won't show up for trainings or meetings. Um, they leave early. Um, yeah, yeah, all of that is red flags. If you have someone that works like that in your office, and I don't care how great of an injector they are, um, they're just not a team player. They don't belong in your in your you know practice. It it creates it really creates some kind of toxic work environment because everybody else is going and everybody else is team building and everybody else you know is really trying to you know, make the practice the best uh, that they can possibly do. And then when you have someone who doesn't want to join the meeting or leaves early, comes in late, um, that's, you know, that's unacceptable. You, it, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're the injector or if you're the esthetician or if you're the front office person. We all are a team when it comes down to it. And we all rely on each other. And um, to have a prima donna in your office really um, is a strain on the other employees. I'll give one last tip that I have learned through my own experience. Yes. That um, injector needs to know that all arrows point to surgery. Um, a lot of the injectors never, they, it's their patients. They protect their patients. But a really good injector works as a team with the surgeon and she or he is the funnel to the surgeon. So when I show up in a practice, I want in-house signage in her treatment room. And it's all about surgery. Like, uh, the, and the patient who's waiting for their Botox or filler to be, you know, prepared, they look over at a digital photo frame and they see tummy tuck, breast dog, breast lift, mommy makeover. And they're like, what? So today they're there for filler. Tomorrow they could be there for a tummy tuck. And that, um, uh, injector needs to have some type of paper trail. I personally like paper trails. So she could have a cute little comp card, a comp console yes. card, yes. And, you know, and she hands it and because the patient looks over and says, wow, can you tell me more about that tummy tuck? And she said, I can do better. We have, um, we charge, um, the doctor, it, it costs, you know, $200 to see him for his time. But because you know me, uh, I can get you in there for free. So here's a comp consult card. And Perfect. literally there's a paper trail straight from that cord, that injector to that surgeon. And now we know that she's working as a team member. And, um, and then the doctor can always give the patient back again to the, to the injector. Like it's such small thinking, thinking, no, 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 I'm going to keep everything with me. Um, that's not how you work this, you know, a, a good surgical patient will go up the ladder, back down to non-surgical, back up to surgical, back down to non-surgical. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, just like when you say abdominoplasty or liposuction or whatever, um, that patient might be inquiring about it's, it's imperative for you to refer that patient to the surgeon for many reasons, because one that's, they want that result. And then that surgeon should refer back to the medical spa, for example, and let's say do maintenance like M sculpt or cool sculpting, use machines that can help maintain the surgery. So it, it works together. It's not just one, it's not just one procedure over another. For sure. Yeah. And there's also one other thing that I forgot to discuss about about injectors is that if you were training an injector and you were doing all this advanced training, which we all know is not 
inexpensive. It's very expensive to train, especially advanced training. I am, I, I like to implement an aesthetic educational agreement with your injector. And essentially what that means is saying that if I invest in training for you to have to know advanced techniques and to be able to, you know, do, I don't know, Russian lips or PDO threads, you are obligated, the injector is obligated to stay an amount of time with that practice until that training investment has been paid off. So I think that's a really big, um, so we don't really talk about it, but I know like a lot of injectors, they want all this training, 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 only to walk out the door. Right. And, you know, you really want to keep them there. And, but it's the same thing with that. If they won't sign it, that's a big sign. If they will sign it, it could still go sideways, but at least you set the expectations ahead of time, you know, exactly, yes. exactly. better all the way around. So yeah. that pretty much wraps it up. Do you have any final words or anything else? No, to- I don't, but it's so great to see you. <laughs> and um, I, I put a light on me because it just got dark. So right. do you see me. I don't know if you noticed. No, I thought, I thought oh that. my God, is that me in there? <laughs> no, I've literally been on these um, Zoom calls where it was getting darker and darker and I'm sitting still and the, the light is way across the room. I'm like, I can't get over there. I don't, uh, and I just started talking faster. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Lisa Marie, thank you so much for being on. How can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more? Sure. Okay. So you can go to my website, lisamariework.com. You can email me at lisa at lisamariework.com, or you can call me at 702-374-1944. All right. (laughs) Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to wrap up this episode. Um, Everybody, thanks so much. Please subscribe to Beauty in the Biz if you haven't already, so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you've got any questions or feedback for me, please leave them on my website at katherinemaley.com. Or you can certainly DM me on Instagram at Katherine Maley MBA. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want, but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. But it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to CosmeticPracticeVault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.